Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. On this occasion, a number of field leaders in the National Farmers Organization, gentlemen who work in the field staff department, have gathered at national headquarters in Corning, Iowa, for a special meeting. And it's our pleasure on this week's U.S. Farm Report to talk to a number of these field staff leaders. For example, my first two guests are Mr. Noah Sugg. Noah comes from North Carolina. And next to Noah is Mr. George Stiles of Kentucky. Noah, George, a real pleasure to welcome you to our show. Thank you. Noah, what first attracted you to the National Farmers Organization? The first attraction to NFO was the hope and I believe that most of all was the chance of holding uh, your own head up and saying that this was one time you could work, fight for what you believed to be the right thing to do, to work for your family, a future, and to build and help build history. What about you, George? No question Noah's right on this, Bill. I have a family and I own a farm. And I think my footsteps are the right direction, or I felt that when I took this position as a farmer. And I think it's a wonderful place to raise children, no place greater. And actually, a little selfish, I want to see my children be able to come back home after they get through school and settle right there. This is what I want them to do, and this is the only way I saw they could do it. Noah, you too <coughs> have been an active farmer and have a family, right? That's correct. Right. How big is your family? I have five children. And it's, uh, it's a family for which you, as you say, hold out some hope, and you find that hope through NFO. I certainly do. Now, let me ask you fellows about the farmers in your area. Uh, Noah, why do you feel that the farmers in your region should have the same attitude toward NFO that you do? I believe basically they have the very same thing in mind, that they would like for their children to remain on the farms. They would like for them to be able to look forward to something, instead of their children having to migrate to the cities, and therefore they have no training when they leave to the farm to go to the cities. They are here, they have been trained to have the right atmosphere to grow up. We can enjoy it, but we can't enjoy it without prices. Mm -hmm. George, Noah has just brought up a most interesting subject, and a subject I know is very close to your heart, particularly since you have just returned from Washington, D.C., where you talked with legislators concerning the Farm Coalition Bill. Now, you told me that you had some interesting discussions with some of the urban national legislators, and you discovered that these urban legislators on the national scene are indeed interested in the farm problem. Why don't you tell our audience about that? We actually went there to visit our own rural congressmen and senators. Well, you want to call it lobbying, I call it just talking to them. <laughs> Plain politics, maybe that's what you want to call it. But some of us ventured out and went to see uh, our city congressmen. I call it city rather than urban, I'm a little countryfied maybe. And surprisingly, when we got there, they were very much interested. They were happy we came to talk to them about the farm bill because nobody else had talked to them about the farm situation was number one. But the main thing, they don't want any more of these rural people wedged in their cities. They already have unemployment. They don't know what to do with them. And they don't want us to come in there. Well, now, we do know that about 2,500 farm families are leaving the farms of America each week. And I guess that we can safely presume that these farmers, when they leave the farm, most of them, at least, go to the urban areas. Bill, we have 5% of our population on the farm. Of that 5%, over half of the poverty of the United States is there. 
half of the poor housing is on the farm. And they realize in the rural and the cities that that half of that population may move in on them any day. That certainly is contributing to what we have come to know as the urban crisis. That is so right. You know, you fellas have to be very dedicated about NFO to work the way you do. How often are you home, Noah? I'm home on weekends. And that's about it. You're sort of a traveling salesman. Well, we could say that. Now, you live in North Carolina, and you work in about, what, 25 or 30 counties of the state of Virginia right now. Right. And what about you, George? This is a little bit of a sore subject with my wife, because <laughs> she says she's an NFO widow. Yes, I imagine that's not a bad phrase to apply to it. But without her, I couldn't leave. She sees to the farm. I'm trying to work over four states. Kentucky, Tennessee, North and South Carolina. Wonderful bunch of people to work with. Fascinating work. I've never seen anything like it, and I think I'm doing a job that cannot be beat anywhere on earth as a service to my people. Noah, what kind of acceptance of NFO are you feeling at this time in the state of Virginia? I feel the acceptance in Virginia is working very well. The people are accepting it as uh, their only answer, their only hope. They see that without something to help them, that they're going, that this cannot continue, this exodus that's been going on. In fact, we've been turned into and told to be a cannibalistic group of people to devour each other and to take over each other's farms. In fact, to grow bigger and to actually by this self-destruction, we could reach success. And this they found is not success, mm -hmm. but failure in itself. And so they are accepting NFO and accepting it as the only hope. What kind of farmers are joining NFO? Noah, how would you describe the farmer who is joining NFO in Virginia today? I find that all types of joining. We have um, a farmer is a farmer wherever, wherever you find him. He has the same problems. Regardless of what he farms, what uh, commodity he's dealing with, it's the very same problem, no price, because he has absolutely no power in the marketplace as an individual. What about you, George, uh, in the state of Kentucky and in the four states in which you're working hard? What kind of acceptance are you finding among the farmers for NFO at this time? I find that the younger people pick this up sooner than the older person. Most of these older people are looking for a retirement plan, Social Security to come through, or they're looking for a job in the city, somewhere. But the younger person that's just started in farming, he's very much interested in doing something because he sees what the other people, the other young people that get out of college, that go to uh, the urban areas. And they see, they see the salary they're getting. They know what's happening. And they feel like it should happen on the farm. I see the younger, a lot of college graduates. Out in uh, Allendale County, South Carolina. We have the chairman there that is a college graduate from Clemson College. The vice chairman is a graduate of Clemson College. The secretary is a graduate of Clemson College. This is what I'm seeing, and this impresses me. We are getting the cream of the crop. Uh, you're working in recruiting, aren't you, George? Just started this. I have uh, been to three colleges in Kentucky, and I am amazed at the number of ladies, young ladies, that know something should be done on the farm, and they feel like they can talk to the farm ladies. This is something I don't know what'll happen. We're waiting to see. And I think we're gonna get quite a few young men, too. Noah, you are also recruiting in Virginia, but your recruiting is of a different nature than George's. Uh, you are recruiting, are you not, your own fellow NFO members? That's correct. You yeah. need their help, and uh, what would you say to those watching today in that regard? I would say that everyone that enrolls in NFO, that they are workers, potential workers, that unless they can realize their responsibility to themselves and to their fellow men, then NFO couldn't work. It has to work by them. They are the key, the key to the success of any farm organization. To NFO, we have to have complete cooperation as one another working with each other. And this is for them to learn and to go out and teach their fellow farmers and to take the responsibility and use the ability that they have 
to work within their own county and within their own state and to help recruit workers to go out outside the counties and also to help there. I think we would be remiss if we were not to mention the fact that you, Noah, represent your own state of North Carolina on the board of directors of NFO. That's right, isn't it? Yes, I do. Bill. And I know that you're enjoying serving in that capacity too, are you not? It's quite an honor. George, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much uh, for being on our show. And Noah, many thanks to you. Thank you, Bill. My next two guests are Alfred Sugg and Paul Fulkerson. Fellas, it's a pleasure to welcome you to U.S. Farm Report. Of course, Alfred, uh, this is my first meeting with you, but I feel like I'm an old friend of Paul's, having uh, run into Paul at convention in, in his home state of Kentucky at Louisville. How's your son getting along, by the Doing way? Doing fine. What was his name? Ricky. Ricky uh, wrote a special poem for convention, which uh, we put on film and uh, which he presented, uh, by the way, to the full convention there at Louisville. So you should be very proud of him. That's right, I am, Bill. You farm a couple of hundred acres, Alfred, in North Carolina, and you're a cousin of uh, Noah's, who uh, appeared earlier on our show. What kind of farming do you do there? Well, it's basically tobacco. Uh, we grow right many soybeans, mm -hmm. corn, little livestock, a few peanuts, and our aerial. Uh, of course, we depend highly on tobacco. And it's like all the other crops, Bill, is uh, in trouble. That same problem. Uh, we've been averaging, well, 18, 20 years ago, we were averaging 7, 72 cents for t tobacco. What are you getting today? About 7, 72 cents. And look what's happened to the economy in those years. Right. And how much more it's costing you to operate. Right. It's the same old story everywhere, isn't it? Squeeze everywhere. Yes, indeed. You're a cattle man, aren't you, Paul? Well, a little bit, Bill. Yeah. How, how's it going in Kentucky in the cattle business? Doing pretty good. Fine. Doing real good. Paul, how long have you been a member of NFO? Well, I'll be a member, Bill. It'll soon be nine years. What attracted you initially? Well, it was my father, Bill. He was a railroader. And I've heard him say lots of times, and. If the farmers ever had an organization like anybody else, they wouldn't have to work for nothing. Mm -hmm. So I took it up. Yeah. How long have you been a member, Alfred? Well, I paid my third year dues. Well, you're a fairly recent member, but a, a three-year-old member in some parts of the country is kind of an old-timer, Paul, too. You know That's that? Right. That's right. Depending on what part of the country you're in. That's right. Uh, what attracted you to it? You've already told me, in effect, you talked about the price situation, and uh, I don't want to answer the question for you, but mm -hmm. I uh, presume that you were attracted by the fact that NFO is trying to make some motions toward getting some fair prices for your commodities. That's true, Bill. Uh, for years I would farm, didn't realize what I was begging. And we had some fellows from outside our state to come in and told we fellows down in North Carolina that we were begging. And I thought, begging, you're supposed to get out on the street, you know, and hold a <laughs> cup and yes. sell pencils. So I found out that there was a way to correct this injustice that we've been doing at the marketplace for a long time. And I've always been accused one to jump at a change. And uh, this is a heck of a change. I think it's a kind of Christian movement, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I saw a chance to help myself, my family and uh, my neighbors. What does it mean to you, Paul? Well, Bill, it means a whole lot to me. In fact, Ms., uh, the first thing, it means uh, a better future for everybody, even the city people, as far as that's concerned. Another thing, uh, I consider myself as a second-class citizen, and automatically when a man goes to the marketplace and says, what did he give me, he is, whether he believes it or not, because nobody else does it but the farmer. So I'm glad to get out of that position. And uh, above all, I'd like for my boy to farm. Yes. And I could give him my farm now, and he couldn't farm it, because with inheritance tax he'd have to pay, he just couldn't make it. What about your job, Paul, <clears throat> with the NFO? Now, uh, are you ever at home anymore? Yeah, I'm at home 
all once, uh, well, I'll say once in two weeks. Once in a while, I'll get home two or three weekends at a time, but uh, very seldom. You have to be a pretty dedicated guy to do that, in my opinion. What, uh, <clears throat> what is your title, and exactly what do you do? I'm an executive assistant to the National Field Staff Department. Well, what does this entail? Well, uh, I'm more or less in the bird dog field, I guess you'd call it. I recruit workers. Anywhere that they have a problem, why I try to help them out, either make it worse or we can better it, and uh, just whatever comes up. Mainly uh, recruiting workers, uh, train, supervise, whatever there is to do. What kind of territory do you cover? I cover uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. Alfred, is your work similar to Paul's? I've been told my time was a regional supervisor. Regional supervisor. And I cover all the territory I can in North and South Carolina, which is quite a territory. But uh, I, basically, I'm pretty sure it's close to Paul's recruit, train, and supervise. And, but um, NFO down our way, as I told you, I t paid my third year dues. and. We have um, half our counties in our state, North Carolina, chartered. We are uh, working pretty good in South Carolina right now. Well, that was my next question, in fact, and you've uh, anticipated. I was going to ask you about how membership is coming along and how well in, uh, in uh, North Carolina NFO is being accepted these days. Real good. In fact, we had a DFR, Mr. Worth Mills, from Taper City. He lives right on the North and South Carolina line. Uh, I remember one day in particular, he enrolled 11 members since the membership dues was raised from 25 to 75. Uh, we see no difference at all. If a man understands 25, he'll join for 75 if he's reasonable. This same man went out the very next day in the same county and enrolled 11 more. About 26 contacts, 22 or three members, something like this. That's marvelous. Right, and it's coming on pretty well. Now, Paul, what about uh, your area? What sort of acceptance are you feeling? Real good, uh, Bill. Uh, the next day after the membership dues went up, I enrolled a man, a second man I talked to on the new agreement. And it's just a matter of getting around and seeing them. Uh, they don't realize today what that they can do for themselves through the organization. And it's like Alfred said, if a man gives 25, if he's reasonable, he'll give 75 or even 175 in order to save his farming operation. So works, uh, they're accepting it real good in my territory. Paul, Alfred, I want to thank both of you for being my guests today on U.S. Farm Report. It's good to get a report from North Carolina, Alfred, and uh, certainly nice, Paul, to see you again. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure. Yes, same to you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like for you to meet Fred Lucas, and Keith Emmenheiser. Well, both of you fellows are from Indiana. Now, where do you live in Indiana? I live in the southwestern part, Bill. How about you, Keith? <clears throat> Pretty much the northeast. Well, you're a few miles apart. I presume that you fellows didn't know each other and were not friends until NFO. That's correct. We're NFO buddies. Now, tell me this, Fred. What is your job with uh, the field staff of NFO? Well, primarily, uh, as of late, it's been uh, recruiting, uh, especially going before the placement bureaus in the colleges and interviewing the uh, college uh, boys. And, of course, we're in a uh, tremendous schedule right now in uh, placing boys in every one to four county area in the United States, and we're putting quite a few on. Well, what about you, Keith? Are you doing much the same in your own territory? Very, uh, very much the same. Yeah. Uh, being New York at the University of New York and University of Maine and VPI in Virginia here in a very short order. Well, now I think I should have asked each of you exactly what territories you've covered. Uh, here you are, uh, an Indianan, but uh, you're really operating in the northeastern part of the country. How many states do you cover up there, Keith? Well, I guess about 10 or 11. Some of them get a little small in that territory, but. Nevertheless, that's a lot of uh, a lot of square mileage to cover, I would say. Yes, it is. How much territory are you covering, Fred? Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan, and part of northern Kentucky, and a little part of Illinois. <clears throat> well, now, what success is each of you having in recruiting these young college people? Fred? 
Well, of course, we've always had some uh, sort of a program to recruit to college help, but never as extensive as, uh, extensive as, we, as we've put on lately. And uh, I would say that uh, the results really have been tremendous in that the uh, college boys now are beginning to grasp uh, this modern look in agriculture, a new era here that the farmers are realizing that they're going to have to do if they intend to uh, be as strong as their competitors to get a prize. Mm -hmm. And even some of the uh, professors uh, like uh, to converse quite a bit about National Farmers Organization and Progress, uh, supply contracts, and so on. Yes. And this interests the uh, college boys very much in marketing, uh, sales promotion, personnel management, and uh, quite a few other things. Well, now my guess would be that recruiting is much easier for you, Fred, out in the Midwest than for Keith in the East. Am I right about that? You are correct on that, Bill. It's, it's a little more difficult, I do believe, because of the different opportunities that large cities have for uh, paying these people. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have been able to recruit and train uh, real good young individuals to uh, come on into agriculture and accept the challenge that is presented to them. Well, boy, you know, I uh, really don't envy either of you your job in this regard because it would seem to me that competition has to be very keen at this time for these young people coming out of college. Uh, all industries need young, well-educated, talented, capable people, just as agriculture needs this type of individual. So uh, you're really in there in some tough competition, aren't you? Yes, but the one thing that so many people overlook, Bill, is that in NFO or in working with the National Farmers Organization, it is something that is brand new. It's something that these uh, young people enjoy doing because of the challenge presented to them. It's, it's not like going into a, a daily routine that's been here for literally uh, hundreds of years. Now, I know that you fellows have to be aware of membership in your areas. Uh, what about membership in the Northeast, Keith? Well, I've been very happy, in a, especially with the state of Maine. In the state of Maine, we've had contracts already on potatoes, mm -hmm. as well as blueberries, and we are now in the process of moving milk. But the regional supervisor in the, in the state of Maine just recently enrolled four members in one day, and one of these members has more blueberries than our total supply contract last year. Is that right? And so it is the large progressive farmers that is joining yeah. NFO. What about you, uh, Fred? Uh, what kind of membership increases have you recognized in your part of the country? Well, in the, uh, in the old areas of NFO, I think that uh, what, uh, what's happened here because of the dues increase is uh, farmers that uh, have held back and uh, were kind of wanting to see what was going to happen. Uh, many of them told us this, of course, they wanted to wait and see. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the some of the processors, I think, were going along this uh, trend also. But uh, now then that uh, the membership has voted the dues increase in, I think they've got a pretty real, real good format there of what the membership intends to do. And the drive we're putting on right now proves it. We've been getting some members in the old areas that uh, agree with us, that uh, they really understand now that NFO means to really get up and go. And since we do, they're ready to go also, and they're going with us. If I were to ask you to describe the prototype of the new member to NFO in your part of the country, how would you describe him? Oh, Bill, definitely uh, the younger set, uh, especially no one I love to talk to any more than some of these, uh, these Purdue grads or the ones that have been educated along the economic lines uh, in some of your land-grant colleges and, of course, some of your others also. But to them, they're beginning to realize that now genuine collective bargaining is as American as apple pie. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very common. The only thing is it's uh, a challenge to agriculture because everyone else has got it taken care of before the farmers. And now then they're beginning to understand that farmers have got to do this. And this is a smart business way about going, about farming in this new area of this country as well yeah. as a new area in agriculture. Does uh, this description apply to the Northeast, Keith? Definitely. Our it's about the same type of new member to NFO in the Northeast that Fred has described in his part of the Midwest. It's the 
uh, young progressive farmers that does understand what it takes to run a successful business. Well, I think that I'm looking at a couple of young progressive farmers. What attracted you to NFO, Keith? It was a chance to be able to really price my product as it leaves based on my cost with a profit. And my wife is one of the individuals that helped me make uh, complete my thinking uh, towards NFO. Mm -hmm. And she said, I've always said that you've been on the wrong end of it. When you've got something to sell, you accept their price. And when you want to buy something, you have to pay their price. Mm -hmm. And she said, if this will correct it, she said, I am completely in favor of it. Fred, what about you? Well, uh, I guess maybe I kind of hate to give credit to uh, my grandfather and my dad, but uh, for quite a while, I can remember when I was driving my grandfather's team of horses, he was still studying about how and why the farmers should get organized the way the rest of the country had beginning to really uh, get into full swing with at that time. And I thought about this and, uh, and thought about it. And uh, he always told me that for the farmers to get an equitable price to marketplace, he was going to have to quit sending that old team of mules to market with that corn. He was going to have to use his head a little bit here uh, <laughs> instead of letting the mules think for him yes. because they would never get a price for him. And he said, we're going to have to get organized like everyone else. And I think when NFO came along, this is one of the very first things I thought about because this is the way everyone else has gotten organized and gotten their price. Well, I hope your grandfather and your dad are both members along with you. They certainly are, and they're very proud of it. How much traveling do you fellas do? Keith, are you ever at home? Oh, yes. I, I arrange my schedule so that I do have some time with my family. Uh -huh. You have children? Quite a large family. How, how many children do you have? Seven boys and four girls. Seven boys and four girls? <laughs> That's quite a family. Uh, can you match that, Fred? No, I'm afraid not. I have to say I'm about seven boys behind. <laughs> Apparently, Keith's been home a little more often than I have. <laughs> you have four <laughs> girls. Right. You know what the statistics say, the odds now, are very much against you if you're after that boy. Because when you have four of the same sex in a row, oh, the odds are tremendous that you will change the run of things. But I'll hope for the best for you, okay? Thank you. It's been a real pleasure having <laughs> both of you on U.S. Farm Report. It's been most fun and informative. And good luck to both of you and your field staff work with NFO. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. The last of our guests have been Fred Lucas and Keith Emenheiser, two outstanding young farmers from the state of Indiana. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week on this station at this time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody.